it is a different market function when you're in a different super cycle. So things don't always work the way that we expect them to, because that's the way that we've always observed them working, right? And on top of that, we've got high inflation, we've got a, a generational bond bear market and moving into a recession at the same time. It's not quite something that any of us have experienced. I think y'all know where I'm starting, right? Y'all know where I'm starting. It's there is so much drama, so much drama on uh, the internet on Twitter right now. Just so folks know, the end of last week uh, was it CoinDesk came out with a tweet that everybody, including myself, retweeted, and um, they announced that the um, the Bitcoin ETF, the BlackRock ETF, was approved. And my Lord, was there a reaction, uh, oh, not just in the price, but like with everybody wigging out. So then this week, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. Uh, Monday, there is a DTCC uh, website that lists ETFs before they... Um, you know, the tickers before they go active and uh, become, you know, what people can log into their trading accounts and buy. Um, what was the ticker on it? It was like IBTC. IBTC. Yeah. So iShares, BTC, uh, of course. They great ticker. A great ticker. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, so this goes up. The the market goes wild. Who knows if it was actually because of that news or what, but Bitcoin is up huge what like four thousand no more than that it was six thousand uh at the highest from it, i think the day started off at like twenty nine thousand it got as high as thirty five thousand for a six thousand dollar in fiat terms move on a single day after this ticker got listed on the dtcc website which doesn't mean that it's active and having been approved it's just getting listed almost like in a, in a preparatory uh position for approval there was also some news that came out that said that uh blackrock was going to begin funding their etf which i have no idea what the source of was that i i saw that on twitter then today tuesday uh, as we're recording this uh it got the dtcc website delisted the ibtc ticker then in the afternoon, it was relisted again. <laughs> and then I had somebody, this guy goes by Army of None on uh, Twitter. He says, also, apparently the spokesperson said that this has been up on the DTCC website since August. Yeah. Nobody noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Kelly uh, Gormley, he, he tweeted that ARC ETF is also listed. So my gosh, uh, and, and I just want to put this out there. I recently tweeted myself, uh, BlackRock isn't making the fiat price go up. The countless psychopaths that have held through 70% drops and bought more is why the price goes up. Uh, and uh, I stand firm on that tweet. Uh, I'm curious. What? <laughs> uh, guys, what the heck is happening? This is crazy. I, is is it? Joe, I'm going to you first. And I know, Stephen, you uh, probably can't say too much. If anything. Oh, I can say a lot. Oh, I love that. Go to Stephen. I, I want to hear. And I hope you do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to hear Joe over. first because I've actually seen a couple of things you've said, Joe, and you've been spot on. So hit it, sir. Do it, Joe. Sure. Well, let's clean up the first one, right? I think it's kind of an hilarious story with the Coin Telegraph, where they basically just had an intern put something in a Telegram chat, and I'm understanding it somehow became news, which is hilarious but, in its own right. But Joe, I guess the I don't know that it was an intern. I think there was a person that was in their Telegram chat, right? That, yeah. that posted it and then disappeared. And I don't even know that they know who the person was that posted it into the Telegram. Has that been established? I, I'm not quite sure either. Regardless to say it was um, 
you know, it, it was clearly, clearly not correct, right? Like that it was approved. But, but I think, you know, you've got a lot of signs out there that, you know, this is the way we're going. I mean, it's kind of hard not to see the, the sequences lining up for this to eventually get approved. It's just a question of when. Um, now, you know, the one thing that is I think it, is, is it that Joe, is it, is it just a question of when, or are we at that point uh, where it uh, is going to get approved? I mean, that's my base case. I, I think it will be approved, but, um, the, you know, the, the big hang up at this point, I think is I believe, and this comes from some folks I've talked to close to the issue that they want to set a clear precedent. Like, so when they, when the, when the Bitcoin futures ETFs launched originally, you had to remember they did that without an order. Right, explaining the rationale, which was specifically cited in the appellate court case regarding grayscale, that they didn't really carve out their rationale. I believe you, this situation will be slightly different. You will get an order approving these in mass. I think you'll get a shotgun approval for most of them. Um, and the very key reason they want to do it in sort of more of a formalized way with an order is because I think they want to set a precedent so that they don't have the Dogecoin ETFs filing next and the Solana and everything else coming down the mm. pipe. Right, they want to have some precedent for why they will list certain um, markets and not others. Um, putting that all aside, right? What's Mark Here's, Cuban? What's Mark Cuban going to do if the Dogecoin ETF doesn't get approved? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Take that up with him next time he's on. So here's what we do know. Okay, what we know from the some official and unofficial sources. Let's start with the official sources. Is that there was updates to various filing documents without getting too technical that many of the issuers, many of the sponsors had to actually submit. They have been updated. ARC, I think, updated one of theirs just today. Um, in addition, there have been postings uh, that were actually made prior to the, gov the supposed government shutdown or the expected government shutdown uh, starting the comment period. And whenever I bring this up, folks generally respond, well, Joe, do you really think a comment period requesting people to solicit comments to the SEC and offer their opinion, that's going to change anything? No, I don't. But I do believe that they will go through the sequence of letting the comment period wrap up. And what do we, what do we know about that? We know that the comment period wraps up for the iShares ETF on November 8th, right? And what typically happens after the comment period is you get a few weeks where they you know, digest the comments, react to it, and then you get some word, you know, from down high that these things are going forward. So where does that set the timetable? That would set it into the middle or early, uh, middle of November, early December-ish, okay, about, that's probably the be best case scenario for hearing approval. And then uh, from there, you got, you know, some time for them to build it out and launch it. But keep in mind, they know well in advance of, of the public hearing the approval. It's not like BlackRock's going to read in the newspaper or any other of these sponsors are going to read in the newspaper that it's actually coming to market. They'll be well aware of it. So I, I do think it's a question of when, not if at this point. I think that the the, the single biggest thing, which I don't know if it was out the last time we talked, um, I kind of remember it was August 29th, I want to say, when the Grayscale victory came down, where Grayscale was able to prove that the SEC treating the mm -hmm. futures market different from the spot was arbitrary and capricious. Uh, that is a massive win, right? That's a very high standard under the law to meet. And their success in that case, I think, was sort of the uh, uh, the impetus, the proximate cause for the SEC sort of waving the white flag on some of these things. The reason I was smiling as as I'm listening to this is because the whole time I'm thinking about your bet with Greg Foss and the timeline, as you were saying, the comment period doesn't even end until December because so much of this sounds very procedural. Like they're not going to break their standard operating procedure within the SEC for a comment period and like all these things. So for you guys that are closely dialed into this, are you looking at the Twitter comments and like the people who don't understand any of this process and just like laughing your tail off because they're just so lost? Or do you think there could be some like one off anomaly where they just blow off their procedures and, and the way that they commonly do business? and approve this thing because there's so much outside pressure, political pressure, whatever, uh, for the approval. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm watching Twitter and just laughing because you've got a million people that, you know, stayed at a holiday in last night and think that they're, you know, a securities <laughs> lawyer. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really funny. And it, and it's, and it starts with it, you, you, you said it, it started with the coin coin telegraph article. First of all, if if you have the word coin in your name, you're not a real news source. <laughs> so, so just, you know. Steven, that is harsh. That is harsh. <laughs> Number one, right? Um, 
but by the way, there's not a lot of good news sources, even in traditional media anymore. It, it's, uh, look at the Wall Street Journal and they're reporting on the the Warren stuff or the, that she was basically using the Wall Street Journal as, yeah. you know, authoritative source that one hundred and twenty million dollars was raised through crypto. And now FinCEN's getting involved. And in reality, it was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars instead of, you know, one hundred and twenty million, which is only what? A, a third of a percent of what she's quoting and basically sending an official documentation to the White House. So like, you know, that's the Wall Street Journal and they they still didn't go back. And so, you know, although I, your your comment does make me laugh, I think that we actually get better reporting out of a lot of these the minus Coindesk, uh, you know, using a Telegram chat to post something on Twitter, which was, I I could only imagine what that turns into, but sorry to interrupt you. Oh yeah, no. I mean, it's just it's so, so 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 that's the first one, and then and then the second one, of course, you know anybody that's ever launched an ETF before knows that you pick a ticker. Sometimes you pick it years in advance. Yep. Um. So 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 we locked down the ticker BRRR for uh, our Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, by the way, I, I think I think for iShares, <laughs> IBTC is fantastic, right? Like that works for them. I think for us, Burr is the right ticker. Um, so, Good Lord, sir. <laughs> so, so we look, we locked down that ticker in 2020, right? Oh, wow. So, so, so the process of, of, of getting a ticker the process of, of of simply creating a CUSIP for a securities filing. I mean, it's just it's just boxes that you're that you're checking, and you've got like, especially bigger shops, right? I mean, look, we we haven't gone out and 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 and, and enlisted in that way yet. But if you're a bigger shop, you've got teams of of product managers, and they've got the list of things they have to do, and they're like, okay, uh, create a CUSIP done. Get a ticker done. List DTCC done. They're not. They're not saying anything by doing that. It's just. It's just the list of things to do, and they're trying to get through the list so that they can go on vacation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 really all it is, you know. That because you, you don't want to be. I mean, look, we're 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 in late October. You don't want to be coming up on Thanksgiving, and be like, oh man, I gotta I gotta work on Wednesday before Thanksgiving because I didn't, you know, get my ticker done. I mean that that's really all it is. It's just a bunch of low level people that are that are that are checking boxes and getting everything in place so that they can just get this complete and and and, and ready to launch when whenever the SEC decides that it's ready to launch. Joe, I thing, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, keep going. Oh, oh, yeah, no. So, so, so the other thing that's really interesting here too is I'm not I'm not going to talk about the grayscale stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll let Joe talk about all that. Um, but um, but but that was a nothing burger as well. Um, the, the court, mandate, yeah, yeah, the mandate, the court yeah. mandated. It's totally expected. Is yeah, when they didn't appeal. You were going to get that order when they didn't appeal. So yeah, that's right. And the order was for the SEC to re-review the application. Nothing burger. Okay, the BlackRock listing. Nothing burger. I mean, the the market's essentially moved up because Mr. Taylor Swift scored a touchdown on Sunday, right? I mean, so 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 really, what happened was. The market started going up on all this news and all this excitement going on and short squeeze and then Asia trading overnight. Uh, the derivatives platforms were, you know, had, had, had high volume and more unwinding of shorts. And so we had this massive swing and now everybody's realizing that, oh, all that news that happened yesterday really wasn't real news. So now we're starting to see the prices go down a little bit. But going back to the process and what's happening with, 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 Bitcoin spot. I mean, look, I'll, I'll verify some of the things that Joe just said. Uh, yes, we received comments from the SEC. It happened, right? Everybody received comments from the SEC. Everybody that had a, a S1 with the word Bitcoin spot on it or an S3 in the case of Grayscale received comments from the SEC right before the government shutdown was supposed to happen. And the process is well, well, but but that's actually pretty significant because we filed our Bitcoin spot ETF in January of 2021. Okay, this is the first time we've ever received comments, and anytime oh, wow. you file anything, you get comments. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time we've actually got it. We understand it to be across the board; they're pretty generic. 
the way the comments work is you go through and you look at what the what they said and you update your filing based on based on those comments right to make sure that proper disclosures are in there um um certain things are answered you know i'm not going to i'm not going to tell you what the letter said but you can you can guess um but but you just make sure that your 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 filing is beefed up enough to where because the sec's job is to protect the public protect the markets and they want to make sure that all the right disclosures are in there and there's nothing that you know there's no risk that, that could you know that could exist that you didn't say exist or um you know there's there's grammar th i mean there's there's all kinds of things that, that that go on but but it was a pretty generic list i expect another round of comments by the way mm. um this week or next and where i think the timeline is uh is i i think joe's right i've been watching that november 8th date pretty closely because um the sec generally waits until the public comment period is closed before they allow something like this to launch so so that public comment period will close november 8th and if i had to guess what the timeline is um has anybody here ever worked for the government or or, or knows people that work for the government oh yeah very government efficient. employees don't work on holidays <laughs> okay so so thanksgiving is an entire week that people generally don't want to work and the whole month of december is pretty much a holiday at this point in time right <laughs> so if if it if a bitcoin spot <laughs> etf was approved say today tomorrow that means that once that once the 19b4 which is the exchange rule uh, exception is approved it's about a 75 day clock until the actual launch and by the way, the 75 day clock is really important because that's the that's the period of time that the S1 now 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 it's not always 75 days. The SEC can make an exception. It can change things. But generally it's 75 days and that gives the public ample time to know that something is coming. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not like in, it's not going to be on Twitter that oh, this got approved and we're going to have a Bitcoin ETF tomorrow. It's a whole 75 day period from that approval of the 19 before day until the S1 goes live. Right. And, and if you, and if you look at the timing, the SEC would typically want about the, you know, the final 30 days before launch to read through all the prospectuses, make sure that all the risk disclosures are correct, that, that, that everything that they need is in there. And they're not going to do that in December. So. I don't think anything gets approved until November 17th. I think what's going to happen is we get another round of comments this week. We go through, we answer them, and then we get a very exhaustive list of comments on November 6th, on 17th, the week before Thanksgiving. And then the SEC is like, okay, we're going on vacation. That you sounds like the government to me. It's right before Bingo. the holiday. They drop all their comments. <laughs> we're we're going to go away. You're going to work through all this. And then, yep. and then for one, we're going to come back, see what you put. And then we've got another like 30 days to like make sure that, you know, there's nothing else. And then you can launch in February. But any date before that doesn't give the government a full 30 day period after mm. Christmas break mm -hmm. to, to, to do their job. Oh, wow. That's a good point. It's looking good for you, Joe. It's looking really good for you and, and your Greg Foss bet. It's just a timing thing. I mean, it really it doesn't change the fact that this is the direction it's headed. Right, it's headed towards approval, which is the the key thing. We can we can say whether it's December or January or November. Well, Foss it, just it, didn't he didn't account the government, uh, you know, <laughs> calendar the the holiday calendar. He was he was off. He didn't take that into account. See that that's that's where I've got <laughs> I, that's what I've got on Foss, man. I mean, we were both bond traders, but like I I have I have family that work for the government. And I, I I know how it works, man. You know the <laughs> deal. You know the deal, Stephen. Um, well, the other the other big thing we didn't mention is that, uh, and and I'm curious to hear Stephen's take on this really quickly is that we didn't get a a new refiled uh, 19b4 for the grayscale following the mandate. Uh, were you expecting that, or do you can you comment on that at all? Did you expect them to just go on the old app, or what? What do you think about that? 
No, I think I think there's I didn't expect it. There look, there's I think there's like three camps of people, right? There are the there are the nervous Nellies on one hand that are like every time that they get a single comment or something changes, they're 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 quickly doing an update, quickly doing an amendment, like, okay, we're here, we're ready to go, let's go. Right. And then you got all the kind of the old pros that are like, oh no, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do everything at once. You know, we're gonna get we got our comments in, we're gonna get a few more. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make sure it's correct. We're gonna take our time and because we know everybody's going at once. And then you kind of got the ones in the middle that are not sure that okay, this could be this, could be this. And sometimes they're hurry up and wait, and sometimes they're not. I mean, we're we're just we're just kind of watching and laughing, you know, and we're like, no, we we know how this works. I I I truly believe everybody's going on the same day. Um you, you know. Anybody well, can there, will everybody be able to launch on the same date logistically? I mean, I, I agree with the approval, but you think they'll be able to logistically launch on the same date? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will create a little bit of chaos with uh, some APs and lead market makers, but uh, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Is, right? is the reason that you guys have so much conviction that an approval is coming is because they lost the the case? Uh, where it, which was the, then the main point of the case that they lost was that they approved the futures. A spot is less risk comp relative to a futures approval. And therefore the, that egregious action is, uh, the reason why the sec is going to have to go down this path. Is, is that the rationale or it, that you have I, so much conviction in the approval? I, I think it's lawsuit prevention. I mean, if, the you, government. You, if you choose BlackRock first, even if it's by one day, mm -hmm. then you've got a mass yeah. lawsuit. You, 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 you'll see Grayscale sue them again. I mean, everybody would sue them. So yeah, yeah, yeah totally. it, But it, but is your see. question is your question why do we have a confidence that there will be approval at all? Is that yes. what the question was? Yes, the both yeah. both of those things. Yes. Well, well, my answer to that is it's not it's not any one thing. It's just sort of the totality of the circumstances, and you know, losing the case asking folks to update these forums and you know just sort of it's laying the groundwork for a lot of this uh, the ethereum futures i mean all of this is showing that they're gonna they've waved the white flag i think but the case was big i mean that was a huge part of it i think in my mind yeah look i mean the comment it's it's both things it's 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 the fact that we're already getting comments and the fact that this this lawsuit did kind of push them into some kind of action um because i, I think it probably would have been another year without the lawsuit. Um, but, but the comment period is really important because, you know, kind of going back to my early, earlier comment, you know, yeah, the SEC has a lot of people, but they've got a lot of things they're dealing with. They, they're, you know, you're dealing with, you're not just dealing with Bitcoin spot ETF, you're dealing with IPOs, you're dealing with making sure that market markets are functioning. You're making, you know, you've got a, mm -hmm. a lot of other ETFs. You've got a lot of these publicly traded vehicles. You've got private vehicles that you're, I mean, you, you've got asset managers that you're dealing with. I mean, there's a lot going on and a government employee doesn't create work for themselves unless they're actually going to do something. Go. So going back to, you know, earlier comments, you're not going to, you're not going to create a bunch of work just to create work for yourself yeah. when you've got all this other, all these other piles of work to do. Right. And that's, 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 that's the comment period right now. So that, that tells me is like, no, they're, they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, like, so once we get approval on the other side of that, um, I know sailor has said that you're basically creating a situation where now, uh, corporate entities have a turnkey solution to have, uh, exposure to Bitcoin, uh, without managing keys and all these other things. Do you think that that is going to be, uh, how this kind of plays out, which turns into a, a massive bull run, or do you think that, you know, I'm much more of the opinion that the hodlers that just endured the, the drop over the last year and a half and, and stacked all the speculators coins through that period of time are the reason that the, that the price action <laughs> does what it does in the next cycle, but it's a little bit of both. Uh, so what are your thoughts after approval, like the impact that, that something like this is going to have? Is it a, is it a major shift? Is it something that is going to be a whole new paradigm, uh, in this next cycle? I don't think it's as big as people think it's going to be. Joe, you, Jeff, Jeff, yeah. Jeff, yeah, let's hear Jeff's thoughts. 
Well, I like hearing your uh, 75 day window, Stephen, because to me, that makes the most sense is I think it's going to be a buy the rumor, sell the news kind of event. So I think it's going to get, we're going to have a jacked up run uh, first, you know, Q1 probably of 2024. Uh, if if the timing works out and then, and that kind of works with my timing and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later in the show but you know macro events that are coming on things like the uh, overnight reverse repo uh, um, markets and and liquidity and all those sorts of things that would fit with what I think is most likely to happen where we get a huge run up based on the ETF and then this it looks like the world's going to collapse the system's collapsing and and Bitcoin just gets hammered back down again. And then we start this, and then it starts in earnest at that point. So then I think, you know, the QE uh, starts again, the Fed steps in again. Um, then, you know, people get serious about the fact that we have these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Money kind of slowly enters into it. I don't think there's a huge wall of money that's just going to jump into it initially. I think a lot of the boomers and the cautious people um, who, uh, who are waiting for this to happen, um, they, they still, I think are going to watch and wait. And, um, yeah, you, so you, so you pop this up. So I, I didn't mean to, to turn the conversation here, but this is kind of how I view all these things is I think at some point, uh, what you'll notice this is the overnight reverse repo, uh, a, a market. Um, it has absorbed a ton of the T bill issuance by the treasury. So as we all know, and I'm sure we'll talk about this too, the government has been on the massive, uh, you know, spending spree. They've been borrowing crazy amounts of money, running massive fiscal deficits, uh, if you'll look, you'll see that little point right at the beginning of the year. Uh, the the yeah, right close to the marker there. So the overnight reverse repo market at that point was 2.55 trillion dollars. And if you fast forward to today, you can see in the upper left hand corner now it's one about 1.1 trillion. So it's down about 1.4 trillion. That has absorbed you know almost all of the issuance of T bills, the short dated uh, treasuries. Um, so, that, so that's great. What that means is that net liquidity has been basically flat instead of getting hammered uh, on the liquidity side. Li- liquidity has basically been f- flat, even though the Fed has still been uh, allowing um, mortgage-backed securities and treasuries to roll off its balance sheet. And even though the Treasury General account has been filling up. Um, why is that significant? At some point, this is going to run out, right? It's a pretty clear trajectory that, that we're heading down if we continue the same rate that it's been going. Uh, it could be January, February, March, somewhere in that time frame where basically the the overnight reverse repo market basically runs out of liquidity. Uh, at that point, I think things get interesting. And by interesting, I mean things could get bad. The treasury market could lock up at that point. Uh, the, it'll be completely dependent on the treasury will be completely dependent on the private markets to absorb their massive, massive amount of issuance of treasuries. Uh, and if they don't, who's the buyer of last resort? It's the Fed. Uh, so that's kind of how I look at all this stuff. I think that um, uh, there's going to be there's still reason to be optimistic. We're still not in a recession technically. That in I'm sure we'll talk about all this too. Uh, but at some point, this is going to come to a head. Uh, we're going to see lots of this um, play out uh, with the move index, right? We're going to watch bond vil- uh, volatility. I think skyrocket at some point, probably Q1 or Q2. Uh, and that's because nobody is going to be willing to buy the treasuries, or at least not not enough people. Uh, and that's when the Fed will be forced to step in and act. And that's where we start getting the next round of QE. That was a huge uh, divergence so, from where, where no, the no, 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 no. It's it's not. This is where I really wanted to go next because as as we're talking about this approval, which is right in the wheelhouse of this timeline that you're talking, which is which is next quarter, right? So when we talk again after Christmas. We're going to be getting right into the heat of what you're talking about, which is the TGA has been heavily u- utilized by the federal government in order to, pr- to provide liquidity into the system so that we don't get disorderly moves in uh, credit and equities and financial markets at large. Um, even though they've been heavily utilizing that and draining that reverse repo facility, we continue to see bonds sell off. Uh, in this past couple of weeks with quite a bit of volatility, um, basically setting new lows uh, way beyond where I would have thought that this would, would have gone. And you combine that with a narrative that, uh, well, I don't even know that I would call it a narrative, that um, that's running rampant on Wall Street, which is are, are we in a debt spiral and are we beyond an event horizon with respect to this, especially in the face of multiple wars and conflicts and 
issues that will just make the, the money printer go, uh, you know what, which is Steven's ticker, uh, <laughs> which is one hell of a brand, sir. I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with that ticker. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I, when we, when we look at all of these factors kind of converging into the first quarter, second quarter of 2024, I guess my question to the group is like, they have to turn the printer back on at some point. So for you, where is that? And when is that? And then how in the world does the, does the treasury market respond when they do that, when we have yields this high and prices this low? Well, bonds are a very simple function of supply and demand, right? And, um, and, and of course, government intervention. So we're at a spot right now where there, we, are, we are having to print more bonds or sell more bonds than demand can absorb. And 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 I've and I've been saying this all year. It's 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 going to happen, right? So when there's a a a lower demand than the amount of supply, rates go up because that means that someone's like, well, I can't really take more bonds. Well, unless I can get a higher rate, then I'll take it because now I'm having to to you know I, I can sell something else that has a, a lower expected rate of return than, than, than what I'm getting over here. So all that's going to do is continue to drive, drive yields up. Uh, it's why the 30 year cross 5%, it's why the 10 years floating up. It's, it's not because we're coming out of a, it's not because we're, we're, we don't expect a recession, which by the way, we, in my opinion, we're already in a recession, but, um, you know, and and the yield curve's inverting because things are going well. The the yield curve isn't really in, you know, de inverting. Uh, it's 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 still inverted, but rates are are, are floating up on the long end because that's just what it's going to have to take for me to buy those bonds. Plain and simple. So I know Joe disagrees with this. Yes. Before you go, Joe, I just want to I want to pose a thought experiment that goes to Stephen's point because I agree with Stephen. I, for the last 40 years, when we go into a recession, treasuries got bid and rates got compressed. If we're truly on the other side of that 40 year bull market, and now we're in a bear market, okay, wouldn't a recession do the opposite of what it did in the past, which means yields would go higher and prices would go further down during a recession? which he's making the argument we're in right now. I mean, what do I know? Which I, I, only, I only traded bonds during the last recession. I don't know anything. Which, which is completely antithetical to, to the consensus on Wall Street, right? Well, the last recession, they went to zero. So, I mean, you know, that's, yeah, that but, just shows you where money goes when it's afraid. It goes into but bonds. I would, and, but, and you had this year, okay, if we were truly in a different dynamic, right? Why did we see the largest single day drop in yields in... 30 years since 1987 when the SVB bank collapsed because all money managers bid up treasuries because that's where money goes when it's afraid. And as growth has reaccelerated, right, which we've seen a growth impulse through the last half of the year uh, that we just experienced, you know, you've seen these, these pre-recessionary trades get unwound. But I, I do want to talk about the funding because what Dr. Jeff brought up, I think, is the key. That that I think that tells the whole story of what what's going on if you want to go there. But let's talk about like the dynamics of supply and demand, which Stephen brought up. Um, basically since late 2022, uh, to the extent Janet Yellen was able to fund the government, she chose to do it mostly through the use of bill issuance, which are far easier for folks to absorb from a balance sheet perspective. You don't have the duration risk. You don't have the exposure, you're just rolling the bills. And then you can make an argument that there was actually a dearth of bill issuances as evidenced by the fact that people were choosing to park money in reverse repo. What she has done since basically the debt ceiling were being resolved, she has issued bills, right? And as starting within basically July, she gave her intention through the quarterly uh, financing announcement, quarterly refunding agreement, that uh, basically she plans to issue more bonds, right? And that's when you've seen the equity market peak, you've seen the long end sell off because you're finally getting supply of duration coming to the market. Because keep in mind, QT, the QT mechanism itself, 
okay, a passive roll off does not actually introduce new bonds into the system. It rolls off the balance sheet and effectively it's repaid, right? It's not like the Fed goes and actively sells that paper into the market, which is a big difference. Now that she's issuing the longer end, that's going to change the supply demand and dynamics that Stephen was just talking about. And then to the point I think uh, Jeff made earlier, right? The Fed in, in many ways was kind of hampered by the Treasury's decision that they were going to basically just spend down the, T, the, the TGA. They were not going to do any issuance. That was going to provide liquidity to the market and they wouldn't have to issue anything, right? So net net, you're not draining liquidity from anything. But now we've got a double whammy because now she has to rebuild the $1.6 you know, trillion dollar TGA, uh, which she's doing, right, by the issuance of bills. But she's also trying to keep that balance sheet composition where that she has sufficient bills and bonds, right? She doesn't just issue her the, the TGA's entire um, uh, account in bills. They have to generally keep, uh, I think I've heard between you know twenty to twenty five percent of it in bonds in longer term paper, and a shorter term paper is like you know, similar, you know thirty forty percent thereabouts, and then there's sort of belly of the curve issuance as well. So th that 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 composition affects the supply and demand dynamics, which you know it's not a coincidence in my mind that smart and savvy bond traders saw there's a heck of a lot of supply of bonds coming to the market as opposed to the last year and a half where there's just been bill issuance, just short dated paper, which is far easier to absorb. Yeah. I mean, look, when, um, when, when, when yields were spiking in June and July, you know, we, we, we run a, a, a hedge fund that's supposed to be focused on crypto. Um, but you know, we didn't really see a lot of opportunity in crypto during that period of time. So what did we do? We, we, we sold out all of our risk positions and started trading T-bills. And I'm just pulling up the chart here so people can can see in the summer right here where we were getting this volatility. Spike. May. Is this, you were talking in May. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So this was this was the bidding from call it October of 2022 until May where you saw that bidding stop. And then it's just sold off. It's just sold off aggressively since that period of time. Mm -hmm. Um so Joe As it's sold off, we've we've traded, we've traded out of that and back into, you know more um more, more risk positions hey everyone i just wanted to take a quick moment here to tell you about this premium superfood shake i have recently fell in love with called cachava cachava is made from plant-based ingredients to power everything you do and help you feel amazing in every serving you get a balanced blend of superfoods nutrients plant-based protein adaptogens antioxidants and so much more as if that wasn't enough Cachava also tastes amazing, and it's helped them earn tens of thousands of five-star reviews. It's creamy, smooth, and it comes in these five delicious flavors. To make it, all you have to do is add water and a little bit of ice with two heaping scoops of your favorite flavor. Then shake it or blend it and have it ready in seconds. Personally, I like to drink cachava as a quick and easy breakfast or even as an afternoon snack when I'm craving something healthy to help me fuel my workday. I'd encourage you to give it a shot too because they have a love it guarantee, meaning that if you don't love it for any reason, you can just get your money back. We Study Billionaires is thrilled to partner with Kachava as they're offering our listeners 10% off for a limited time. Just go to kachava.com slash WSB. That's spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A and get 10% off your first order. That's kachava.com slash WSB. So, Joe, the point that you made earlier that in uh, in COVID, how it got bid, I mean, it got bid down to, I think the 10 year was down to like 50 bips or something like that. For me, yeah. when I'm talking about the thought experiment that I proposed, right, like <clears throat> that was literally the top, that moment that co it, in COVID when the 10 year was at, call it 50 bips, that was the, the sheer top of a 40 year bull market in bonds. It may have and been. Yeah. And and now I think now that we're on the other side of that hill, and now I would say we're in we're getting ready for a, a long term bear market in in bonds, I just would I would expect the yin and the yang of of what we've seen historically, that when you go into a recession, instead of it getting bid, you actually see it sell off and the yields pop even more through a recession. Well, go to what what did you just say? The yin and the yang, right? Yeah. Pull up that chart of of the ten year, right? What yeah. you see in the ten year is you see it basically like a step ladder down all the You're way. You're saying during the Silicon Valley Bank scenario? No, no, no. I'm talking about the 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 thirty year chart. Pull up the thirty year chart of the ten year. Just 
you know, a long dated chart of the 10 year going back to the, the 70s and 80s. Um, what, if you pull up that chart for the 10 year, you see a stair step down, right? Yep. And what what tends to happen is as you're entering a period of growth coming out of recessions or uh, sort of downturns, even not if it's a formal recession, but downturns in the economy, is yields tend to rise coincident with economic growth. Yields rising are generally a sign of strength in the economy, whereas yep. yields falling are a sign of weakness, right? Every yep. single major recession uh, led to the yield. So what, to your point, if you're going to go the opposite, so the opposite chart and you're entering a structural bear market in bonds, you wouldn't expect it to just go straight up regardless of economic conditions. You would expect it to go up and then in a recession decline, but not go back down to the low to set a higher low, right? It's, that's the opposite, right? So imagine a recession where the 10 year is currently trading, you know, close to 5%, you know, 4.8, whatever it was at today. Imagine it goes into recession and you only get it down to three and a half. And then the economy starts to reinflate. And then the next cycle, you take it above. Uh, the, the prior high, you go instead of, you know, four, five, you go to six and then it goes to five in the recession, but then it goes after that because you can't get inflation in, under control. And, and there are many economies where the, you see this, you see it move in these large historical trends where it goes, trends down, hits the generational low. And then if you have a more inflationary decade due to structural supply shortages and other issues, you have a stair step up, but markets don't generally go in a straight line. They, you know, tend to, you know, go through cycles like everything else. Stephen what, uh, and Jeff, what are your thoughts? Anything to add on that one? I'll just throw it out there that I agree with Joe. A couple points. I think that we are officially back in a bear market. I think we're in a 40-year, 50-year type trend. I think the bull market is over for sure. Um, I do in agree. Bonds. In, in, in bonds. In bonds. In bonds. Yes. yes. And so, and so during periods of growth, as Joe says, we see interest rates rise. I think we're going to see something in this decade similar to the seventies, even though there's a lot of difference from the seventies. I do think one thing we share is that we're going to see these large, uh, moves in bond yields. Uh, so we're going to see these periods where we have this inflation is a concern. Yields are rising. You know, we've already gone from you know, zero to 5%. We saw back in the uh, early 70s, yields went up to like 8% or so. And then during a recession, they dropped all the way down to about 3% or so. I would not be surprised to see the same kind of move this time around. Maybe we get up to 55 or 6% on the 10-year. Recession hits, everybody piles into the 10-year. Uh, I think maybe go back down to 3, 2 and a half, somewhere like that. But I don't think we go back down to zero. I think the zero interest rate days are over. Right. This, this and by where, the way, this is... Sorry, Preston, go. Oh, no, I was just going to say that... that uh, where I think this is so different than anything we've seen in the last 80 years is you were never at a debt to GDP of 120% plus. Now you are. Now you are. And I think everybody's looking at the, at the fiscal responsibility of appropriators and they're saying it's getting worse by the day. They're getting more irresponsible by the day and their issuance to cover this irresponsibility plus the existing debt burden, which is 120% plus, is why I guess I have the opinion that it's not going to get bid. But but I but I want to I want to emphasize this. I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Okay. I'm just it it doesn't make sense to me from the math standpoint and looking at the holistic picture of how in debt we are, that that would be the case. But if I was going to argue with myself, I would say the fractional reserve nature of fiat itself and how it becomes impaired and disappears because it's nothing but promises is why maybe it, it would, right? Well, well, here's the question. Where does the bid come from? And, and if, you, yeah, I, if, you, if you think no, about that question- I can't tell you. <laughs> the government. <laughs> I, I can't tell you either, right? It is the I, 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 I can tell you. Go look at the chart we posted. That, that's a, the segue of the BOA chart. I mean, that's well, which the data. One talk, which think, one you think talking about to? the different segments of investors? You know, so, so first of all, retail investors are are completely done right now. Um, and retail investors typically spend um, excess capital on, on 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 investment, but if you can't afford food, gas, and housing, you're not investing your money, and you're certainly not investing in bonds. Okay, now let's look at um, the larger pools of capital, right? Uh, let, let, let's start with the, let's start with a pension fund. Okay. Are, are pension funds going to buy treasuries and a flight of safety in a flight to safety? The answer is no, not in a 
high inflationary environment. The reason why is because pension funds have to earn even more money in a higher inflationary environment to pay their pensioners, right? So, so they're, so, so it's not five to 8% anymore. It's going to be eight to 12% to be able to, 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 to fund pensioners. Okay. The reason why number, number one, inflation, number two, you're not going to get that yield in bonds. So pension funds will typically stay risky, right? When I say stay risky, um, it's not going to be treasuries. It's going to be things like asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, high-yield bonds, um, even even you know, cusp credit, uh, double B, triple B, single A minus uh, to to get enough yield to over to 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 overcome that. Insurance companies. That's 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 the next one, right? So, insurance companies. Uh, have to manage their actuarial assumptions, right? Actuarial assumptions go up in a higher inflationary environment. So if inflation is at two percent, that's that's fine. You're you're probably targeting five, but if inflation is three, four, five percent, now you're targeting eight percent. So you're not going to get the yield you need in treasuries. So even in a flight to safety, there, you're 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 going to go after higher yielding products and higher return products might even be increasing their allocation to things like private equity, right? Um, there's a big area to invest there. So you, you've got that. And then you've got financial advisors. That's another big area, right? So financial advisors, when you have low consumer sentiment, you've got higher inflation, their clients feel a little poor. So they're not necessarily buying treasuries there in a flight to safety, they're buying um, defensive stocks, right? Because they still need to hit targets. So, so you don't have a bid on treasuries. So, if you could pull up the chart, Preston, this is the one that start the one you had up, the treasury okay. flows one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. This one's the only chart you really need to look at, along with the BOA flows one. If you look on the right side for the viewers that can't see um, and they're just listening to the audio, there's a black line. Okay, and the black line indicates when the Fed started raising rates. There's a green line that shows the Fed is obviously in a steady decline. They're doing passive roll off in the form of QT, but you see the fastest increase in terms of buying from households, which is the blue line at the bottom. The orange line or, or yellow line that says real money that has declined, but is now ticking back up. That's that is defined as institutions under the graph. Um, the foreigners obviously are uh, also increasing their holdings of treasuries based on in, in, maybe uh, not to the highest level, but they're nearing record highs. And then if you look at the second chart I sent you, the BOA private client flows, that's a stunning chart. It tells you the preference of private clients, which BOA Global Strategy Investment, my understanding is defines those in excess of holdings with a billion dollars. And you see the fastest flows to debts as a percentage of assets under management uh, in the last over 10 years. Um, can you pull that one up? The It says BOA. Yes. Yeah. See, look at that. I mean, look at you basically went from massive outflows uh, through 2013, 2014, and also you know huge sales of bonds when the Fed's buying them really in 2020 uh, to where we saw uh, you know the last year, which has been effectively let's ape into bonds. And this is also uh, confirmed by some of the flows to TLT. Believe it or not, the number two ETF right now in terms of purchases by retail uh, this year is the TLT ETF, the long bond ETF. And it's kind of stunning. I think Lynn Alden posted a chart about this, that despite getting their faces ripped off by a constant <laughs> uh, decline in bonds, like the retail is aping into bonds, uh, particularly older folks who can say, hey, if I can just get 4% of my money, I don't really care about any of this else. I I, I will be happy with 3 or 4% of my uh, my money. That, that'll that get me through uh, you know the next 10 years. Little do they know that inflation is a problem. But I think the way to look at it is like the Fed is effectively paying a premium right now. Uh, mostly uh, in in the form of having these really high rates, which I disagree with, Paul. I think they are restrictive. I think it's just a matter of time before you have to get the the, the maturity walls hit. But they're paying a premium, probably before our above our star, what the natural rate of inflation would be to conquer inflation. They're trying to smack the economy hard enough 
to bring inflation down where these bonds actually have value and are attractive on a real basis. And I mean, you've got real rates now across the curve. And that's a different dynamic than we've had for the last 10 years. That's a different dynamic for investors. I mean, heck, we were I was listening to a podcast today about tips. You know, you're getting 2.5% on a real basis for tips. That, that That's like unheard of. Um, so I, I definitely think there's a bid there. Now, whether the bid comes at a higher yield, sure. But, you know, it's like the old adage says that it, I know Stephen's uh, uh, aware of. It's like, you know, there's no bond. There's no bad bond you know, uh, but no bad ba bonds. There's bad bond yields, right? There's bad bond prices. There's bad, you're paying for bad instruments at bad value, but th that's a different dynamic than we've had in the last 10 years where, with zero policy. And, and to that, you're saying that in a world where everybody's got massive issues, the U.S. debt, because it's better than all the other, you know, turds out there is why it would get bid. Yeah, and and, and keep in mind, it, it will get bid in a recession, right? When you're on the doorstep of a recession and you're afraid to hold some of these other assets we've talked about, stocks and you know your, your private equity in a recession, man, I, I wouldn't want to have exposure to a ton of that. Um, same thing with real estate, other other uh, other aspects, other assets, right? But I think from my perspective is if you don't get the recession, if there isn't a recession, you're exactly right. Yields are going higher. This is why people like. Um, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon are saying 7% rates are possible, which, you know, if we don't get a recession, I think that's where we're headed, uh, to be quite clear. The, but if you're predicting imminent doom and the economy rolling over, you know, bonds are going to get bid. And by the way, this is what Bill Ackman said, right? When he said, I covered his bond short the other day that caused that reaction in the marketplace. And, uh, you saw, uh, you saw 17 BIP drop, I think within an hour or two, uh, at the long end, uh, crazy moves, right? It's trading like, uh, like an altcoin. Um, you don't see that with the US Treasury market. That's crazy. But the interesting thing he said was that, you know, the world's too uncertain. There's too much risk in the marketplace to be short treasuries. I mean, I think that's telling what, you know, at least uh, some big money managers are thinking. He their, didn't say that he went long either. No, he didn't. But he said it's too <laughs> risky. He's too risky to be short, right? Because you would blow up if 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 bonds get bid. Yeah. Or the, yeah, the government steps in and basically either one. It yeah. doesn't matter, yeah. right? So, so you posted this idea on Twitter and Joe, if, if you don't want me uh, putting this up here, I just, you know, I'm going to quickly show folks this, you quick, quickly posted something back in September about this idea that, you know, foreign countries are dumping these. I responded with a Luke Roman report that I had recently <laughs> read kind of, uh, com you know, providing a counterpoint to your argument. And then Luke piggybacked on on my comment and was basically saying that this gap, this ever expanding gap between the federal debt, the total public debt, and uh, the held by, the the amount held by foreign entities, international investors, is is diverging and growing further apart. And that's the point that's more important than just looking at the nominal value of of treasuries being held by foreign entities. Because as, and I'm just going to try to explain his point of view, if, and maybe I'm doing him a disservice, but his argument is as the fiat money supply, M2 money supply is, is drastically expanding, that expansion relative to the amount that foreign entities can buy up is, is the point of why it's becoming uncontrollable, to which there was a long exchange back and forth between the two of you here. People can go dig this up and... and uh, read for themselves what what they think but if you were going to counter that argument that luke was making in his response to you like what well, how do you respond to that yeah well, we, we have to look at who holds the debt right, right now right i mean you hear this this constant hysteria over china selling treasuries right and i posted a follow-up tweet to this china holds less than two percent of all u.s debt okay less than two percent if they were to dump all of their debt Right, they would cause volatility and yields would spike on an interim basis. Right, but two, three percent. All that means effectively is you need more. You first of all would make it more attractive to domestic buyers, which hold the majority of the debt anyway. And guess who holds the single biggest amount of the debt right now? The Federal Reserve. Right, they hold the majority of the Treasury. So for folks constantly fretting and wringing their hands about foreign buyers not buying it, to me, it, which you know depending on your political perspective or how, however you, you want to see Bitcoin uh, succeed and respond to all this, all I think it means is you you will eventually move closer to having the Fed have to uh, monetize more of that debt. But 
you know, I mean, the, the the fact that we're in a debt spiral when you've got you know many countries well worse off who don't have access to the dollar, don't have access to the U.S. Treasury as a collateral asset. I think it's just kind of fantasy. I mean, the, the Federal Reserve. I expect it before any you know sort of collapse of the system that you hear people talk about. I expect their balance sheet to eventually go north of twenty, thirty trillion. I mean, I think that's where it's going. Uh, that could take twenty, thirty years from now. I see Jeff nodding his head. I'd be interested in his take. I mean, the notion that we're at the end of this is just kind of you know, I think it's extreme. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in there. I, I agree, Joe, and I, I feel kind of like um, the anti boy who cried wolf because right now it's super sexy to talk about the debt spiral. I don't think there is a debt spiral. I think it's just business as usual, personally, right now. I don't think that, that because a debt spiral insinuates there's an acute, terrible, out-of-control type event that's going to lead to you know massive, more and more debt issuance and eventual hyperinflation. I do not think that's going to happen at all. Even though, yes, we're at 120% debt to GDP, I think 10 years from now, if we're still having these conversations, the debt to GDP is going to be like 190%. And we're just going to be kicking it, talking about like, is that sustainable or not? Are we in a debt spiral or not? I think it's going to be just kind of more of the same. Uh, So I guess I agree with Joe. I think there's too much um, concern and worry about that, even though is it a problem for sure. But look at Japan, right? And I know we're different from Japan. uh, But I just think that this is the way the world works. And unless the one caveat to all of this is if we do hit a World War III, uh, that's where spending gets out of control. That's where the U.S. dollar would be at risk for actual hyperinflation. But barring that we don't enter a World War III type event, I think we're just going to continue business as, as usual. We're going to continue to pile up debt. Uh, and it's not an out of control debt spiral. It's just more of the same. Steven, but that's unpopular. Stephen, unless you have something to add, I'm going to move on to one more uh, topic here. Nothing to add. Nothing to, nothing to add. <laughs> hey, can I add one anecdotal thing? Yeah. Uh, to 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 correlate with what uh, Joe's chart showed, you know, I've been running a fund since the beginning of 2014. For the first time since 2014, this month, I've actually added fixed income to my fund and for my client accounts, above and beyond. So not treasury, but actually, so like uh, senior loan, senior credit, um, uh, taxable munis, those kind of things. I, I, we're getting a yield of about eight ish percent, seven and a half, eight percent. Um, first time in, in so basically 10 years. So I actually think this rise that we've seen in treasuries is, uh, healthy, uh, you know, could it go higher for sure? But then I plan on buying some more and, and, and pushing my yields up to more like nine or 10%, which I think would be fantastic. So I think what's fantastic about this, this rise in yields is that there finally is an alternative to stocks. Uh, we finally have another asset class to invest in, which I would say has been uninvestable practically for the last 10 years. So, Which is so important. If I could just jump in real quick, okay? So so everybody knows the the uh, pitfalls, I think, of the passive indexation, right? And, and the passive 60-40 portfolio. And we all complain about it, right? Because it's not, I, th- I don't think it's a good risk return to have 60-40 bond stocks, right? But there are a ton of people that do have it. And what I think is really key to understand right now is as bond yields rise, the bond prices fall, basic bond math, right? And in that dynamic, your 40% of your portfolio loses value. And what happens? What does that do to the equity market? That causes all the passive indexation and all the vehicles that the 60-40 portfolio responds to. It causes them to sell their equities and rebalance into bonds. And you see this in some of the Vanguard target date funds ever so slightly. It's probably why we didn't reach a new all-time high this year. You see some of the passive flows starting to turn from equities to fixed income because of that reason. So I I think that's going to really wreak havoc on the folks that are 60-40. I think they will continue to sell their equities, which are better performing, into bonds to rebalance. Are you guys bullish here on on bonds because you know the government's going to intervene or because you think market forces are naturally going to to create a bid? I'm not bullish on bonds. I don't I, I'm not somebody who's Good. saying like I, go okay. go load up on fixed income. That's not what I'm uh, so don't don't accuse me of that in the comments uh, for the, <laughs> the trolls. That's not the point. I'm saying all I'm saying is there are structural reasons in place why bonds could catch a bid. Okay? I'm I I have no exposure to these and Steven things. Steven agrees. Point. You're 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 giving a little nod that look we're 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 we've we've completely changed and Jeff and Jeff and Jeff said this, right? We are in a generational bear market in bonds. 
Um, most of us have only lived through a generational bull market in bonds. Well, all of us here have. Yeah. Right. And 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 certainly, um, you know, there's 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 very few people left that are still very involved in capital markets that were that were pre-1984. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, and uh, you know, I th- those those are guys that I love talking to, right? I mean, I I love talking to Mike Milken, who was around right before that, you know, and uh and 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 some of the stories that he tells. And um but there's just there's just not many guys like that left and it 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 is a different it is a different market function when you're in a different super cycle right so things don't always work the way that 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 we expect them to because that's the way that we've always observed them working right mm-hmm. and on top of that we also have a a 1970s like environment um, where we've got we've got high inflation, we've got a, a a bond bear market, a generational bond bear market, and moving into a recession at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's it's not quite something that any of us have experienced, and and it's even difficult to look at history to determine what will happen. I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about is like, okay, well, this is what's been happening for the last year or the last six months or happening today, but that will all change when. I mean, we 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 hit on it briefly. World War Three, right? We've got a war going on in Ukraine that looks like it's never ending. We just entered into a war in the Middle East that that has never ended since 1947, and and is going to continue uh, at, a, at a at a at a at a at a pretty uh, interesting level. Uh, we've got people aren't even paying attention because of because of those two situations. What's going on in Korea? What's going on in Taiwan? What's going in going on in, in, in the Philippines? So we could very easily move into a situation where we've got war in the Middle East, Asia, Europe, all at the same time, and and, and sides are being determined as we speak. I mean, most people kind of already know where the sides are, but uh, this 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 does look like World War Three, and that changes everything. Well, okay. before it was the petro, uh, the movement to the petrodollar system, and now we're just moving to a Bitcoin system. That's and, right. You know, it's uh, if if only people could figure out like what the education is on Bitcoin, I think we could have a whole lot more uh, peace around the world. Uh, you know. Anyway. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about here uh, is the high yield uh, spreads. Uh, so I'm going to put up a, a chart here of the high yield spreads. Joe and Jeff both submitted this slide, so I figured we should cover this. Um, what's what's the narrative? What's the voice over here? Why is this important, guys? Well, I'll just start since we both submitted it. I I included it all the way back to like '98. Uh, Joe's this one goes back to 2016 here. So the the um, the point of this is. When high yield spreads start to blow out, that's usually a good sign that we're heading into a recession. Uh, it doesn't always mean that, but it's one of the indicators I look at. I know it's one of the indicators Joe looks at. I'm sure all you guys look at this too. Uh, there's lots of things you can look at, right? The price of oil, high yield spreads. You can look at unemployment. Those sort of things tell us that a recession is actually imminent, like we're heading into it. So right now, the, the spread between uh, when we say high yield, most people know that is junk bonds. So the, the spread uh, between junk bonds and their underlying treasuries is still, if you look at it, it's what it, it doesn't say on here, but that's about four and a half percent or so. Um, that is to the level where I, I start to notice it. I don't really pay attention to this until it gets above 5%. Once it hits 5%, I think, okay, this is worth paying attention to now. Sort of like the move index, which we had uh, talked about earlier. Once it gets above 125, I think it's concerning. Once it's above 150, I think the, the central banks have to decide what to do about it. Um, so we're still in the uh, the part of the um, uh, high yield spread, uh, OAS spread. Uh, where there's really nothing to do about it. It says that we're not yet in a recession. I think that's why when we talk about, uh, you know, are we in a recession? I don't think so. I still think things are okay. And then one other thing that I didn't uh, submit a chart for, but the S&P composite index came out today. It was 51. Uh, it's still, it's it's an expansionary mode. It's actually increased a little bit. Yeah, here's a longer data chart. So, kind of, you know, same chart that Joe showed, but 
we're really not out of uh, uh, out of the uh, range of normal uh, for where this spread is right now. If it jumps above five and heads towards six, then I'll start getting concerned and I'll start probably telling people that it looks like we could be headed into a recession if other indicators correlate that. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's why I remain crabbish uh, because liquidity continues to remain crabbish. And that's one other chart I showed is we're still range bound for from a net liquidity perspective since April 2022. We're literally in the exact same range that we've been in since April 2022. That's what, 18 months or so. Um, so I don't expect much from risk assets or even Bitcoin, honestly. Uh, yeah, here's another chart I showed. It's kind of a sloppy chart, but basically what that shows, that big, long uh, um, blue thing on top, WALCL, that thing, that's the net liquidity since the beginning of April 2022. And then what I put over that is uh, what the NASDAQ stocks have been doing, uh, small caps, the S&P 500 and Bitcoin. You'll notice that the small cap stocks, which is that teal line, uh, is basically trading in parallel with what net liquidity does in the U.S., um, the queues are uh, per- outperforming it. They're up about 16% over that time period. I think it's because the queues in general, mega cap tech stocks are seen as worldwide assets and not necessarily just US based assets like US small caps are. So that's why uh, uh, I think around the world, they tend to view that as kind of a safe haven asset, almost not quite on par with treasuries, but but it's sort of up there. Uh, and then uh, Bitcoin, you see it took that big dip down and it's been catching up again. So a month ago, uh, before if you, if you kind of negate that last line, I was saying that I think uh, Bitcoin is still oversold and it needs, it needs to catch up uh, basically to net liquidity, uh, whereas uh, the queues look kind of overbought and need to come down a little bit. And then one last point, and then I'll stop talking, the bottom part of the chart with that pink box, um, that's my poor man's version of uh, worldwide, basically M2, kind of worldwide liquidity. Uh, and um, what you'll see there is that it had, has dropped since uh, April of 2022 by about 10% uh, or so. And so if you wonder why uh, you know risk assets, Bitcoin and things have not been performing very well and why I still remain crabbish and not overly optimistic, it's because of those factors. I think of that as the oxygen for markets, especially for risk assets, especially for Bitcoin. Uh, and as, until those things make a noticeable move higher, uh, I just won't get uh, overly optimistic or overly bullish. Uh, sorry, I, I dropped your chart there and I brought up no, it's great. Uh, global M2 uh, combined here of all the different M2s all denominated in USD. Uh, so people can kind of see what that's looked like over the last you know, decade or so. I love it. And notice the, like the rate of change, which I think we're showing on the bottom there. Yeah, uh, like it it has bottomed. It did bottom in the fourth quarter of 2022. I remember we talked about this on this show a couple couple episodes ago. Um, but it's general uh, generally trending higher. But we still haven't seen uh, sort of the all in. You know, the the all the central banks throwing in their hats and going back to QE. They're very reluctant right now uh, to do any sort of QE because of the higher inflation. But at some point, and I think probably some point soon, uh, like Q1 or Q2 of 2024, I think they're going to be forced to do QE and that's where things get real again and get kind of exciting again. You know, I, I, I look at the high yield spreads and I actually see something entirely different. If you look at that chart again on um, uh, option adjusted spread, what I see is institutional investors are trying to hit targets, right? And, um, and they're simply reaching for yield. Uh, you, what, what you have to remember is typically high yield Bonds are uh, our maximum uh, five-year maturities. So, so this spread is actually to um, it's 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 actually to the five-year. In some cases, the two or three-year. So, um, it's it's not actually that indicative of what's happening on the long end of the curve. The second thing that I'll that I'll point out is, so institutional investors are are simply reaching for yield. So they're getting, in in some cases, up to ten percent. But uh, and and that's enough to really pad a portfolio and to enter into a barbell strategy of of riskier assets with a with a with a, with a ten percent yield that they can hold on to for the next five years. And I believe they're and I, and I believe investors are doing that because uh, there is a a belief that the Fed is going to have to lower rates and this is and this is simply a trade um but what i see is high yield bond investors aren't actually getting rewarded 
for the risk that they're taking. Um, I think default rate, so so this is also indicative of what a potential default rate is, right? Potential default rate of of a five percent, in my opinion, is is pretty low for the risk that we're in right now. Um the the spread should be closer to seven to eight hmm. percent, uh, given the environment that we're going into. So um I, I think you're gonna see in some cases, you know, faces getting ripped off. And this happened uh, back in 2006, 2007 as well. Uh, there was there there were there was there was such a uh, a demand for yield that spreads were really tight, and then they blew out all at once, right? And you yep. can and obviously mm-hmm. you saw that on the chart. But there's two different types of high yield managers, right? There's the type that actually analyzes the debt that they're going into, and they're only buying higher quality uh bonds that 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 still have a little credit rating and then there's a type that are just buying the market right it's 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 no different than guys on twitter you know that 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 we deal with in 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 the in the crypto community right there's the people that actually understand what they're buying and focusing on bitcoin the high quality stuff and then there's people that are like buying doge hoping for a quick lift um pe- people think that um that traditional money managers are super sophisticated and most of the time they're actually not they're just buying the market you know if you if you look at you know some of the bigger bigger asset managers and you think oh you know that i'm really impressed you know they have over a trillion dollars in assets well when you have that much in assets you're forced to buy the market and you're forced to buy the along with the good stuff and anything that's available and you're forced to buy yield and duration so, uh, so, 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 so what I'm seeing is I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a potential disaster in the high yield bond market. Hmm. Yeah. If I could tie both of those comments together very briefly, Preston. So if you pull up the chart, the one that says net interest costs, I think it tells the full story of what's going on here and why this cycle has played out very differently than prior cycles. Um, so, you know, most of well, all of us really on, on, on the call here, we have lived through a period where the Fed hikes, particularly they're hiking aggressively, and you see a leveraged player in very short order get blown out, and the Fed has to respond very quickly. What this chart shows, and I think it's confirmed by also some of the maturity data we have regarding high yield, is that in past hiking cycles, you see almost right away a response as a per- percentage of net uh, interest costs from companies that they have to absorb those higher rates, right? You see a very responsive, reactionary effect on companies, particularly their net interest cost from a hiking cycle. You haven't seen that this time. We've engaged in the fastest hiking cycle in the last 40 years, and you have seen actually net interest payments as a percentage of post-tax profits decline. Why is that? How can that possibly be, be the case, given what Stephen and, and Jeff are saying? And, and my read of it is that many companies and individuals were you know, pigs at the trough, loading up on cheap debt. In many cases, they loaded up on five or 10-year paper, longer dates of maturity than at any point in the last 40 years, which makes sense because interest rates were at zero. So when the Fed engages in their hiking cycle, they could hike, them to, hike rates to 10%. In the short run, it's not going to effectively affect the people that impact the people that took out a lot of paper and have that paper until it has to be rolled, most of beginning in next year and into 2025. There's very little high yield that had to get rolled this year on a relative basis. Most of it starts to pick up next year and really ramps up into 2025. And if you talked to uh, various clients that are entrepreneurs and innovators and small businesses, They are telling you that they're banking on the fact that interest rates are going to come down. They're going to be able to roll this paper in the middle to later part of next year. I've talked with, you know, uh, CFOs on this subject in particular. There just seems to be this blind faith, or maybe it's, uh, 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 you know, some sort of illusion that they're all playing that they believe that they're going to be able to roll this paper when in reality they're going to have to roll it at two, three, four times higher. And that's going to really start to affect things. But the problem is they haven't had to roll it yet. So, you know, if you're a company, if you're an individual and you haven't had to roll the paper yet, interest rates in the short run are kind of, you know, uh, they're they're not particularly meaningful. Well, and you make a good point. The the higher credit rated companies aren't going to have a problem. It's the, it's the, you know, the triple C's, the single B's, 
they're the ones that can't even get five year paper done. Right. Right. They're the ones that are issuing two, three, four year paper. And they're forced to refinance often as opposed to waiting. So they're the ones that are going to be impacted the most. And uh, so so we'll we'll likely see um, default rates uh, up, up among those groups much higher than, you know, say double B. So you see this in the charts, right? Everybody says, well, the stocks are in a bull market. Pull up the micro caps ETF, the IWC, right? Micro caps. You just hit a new low, taking out the 2022 low. Look at IWM. IWM, same story, right? Hovering right at the 2022 lows. Looks like it's going to break down eventually at some point. Those are more interest rate sensitive companies where you have your mega caps, which Chef talked about. They're bulletproof, right? They're international assets. There's no way Apple's not going to be able to, uh, arguably, they're, they're, people are going to want Apple bonds over U.S. government bonds, right? So, I mean, they're not going to have they're not going to have these sort of issues with higher rates, whereas the smaller players are going to get knocked out. Yeah, and and what's 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 really interesting here too, as well, is that um, you know when 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 this really starts going down, um, the 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 highest correlated assets to High yield bonds is actually the S and P. So if you start seeing high yield bonds blowing out, or start seeing defaults, then you're going to see a massive move down in the S and P. Look at IWM, Preston. You had IWC. That's real small micro caps. Look at IWM. Look at the chart. Does that look like a bull market? Doesn't look like a bull market to me. Yeah, you've been and in a sell off for how long here? Seven hundred and nineteen days. Right. So, so the, the, that's the interesting thing. I'd love to hear Jeff's point on this. Like, if it were purely liquidity that was driving assets, right? Why is IWM look like this? To me, well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, if I can, it, it actually almost perfectly mirrors net liquidity. Remember what I said that net liquidity is chopped sideways and has been range bound since April 2022. Look at this, that how it, uh, where it starts. Uh, not that if you can go to April 2022 with your marker, I don't know if you can get that. Getting there, July, June. See that? Yeah. yeah See how right. it's choppy right there? It almost yeah. perfectly correlates with the movements of net liquidity. I don't make the rules. I'm just, and, and I could be wrong, but it's uncanny how closely it follows net liquidity. So, but, but it's a totally different chart with S&P, right? So like those- so S&P those... is different, but, but because S&P has the mega cap tech stocks, which are the international assets as we talked about. Yeah. So that pulls it higher. So would you would you characterize it that assets like the S&P are not as liquidity sensitive? Here's they since are... April, right around here. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, so what I've noticed with um, the Qs and uh, the S and P five hundred, because of the mega cap tech stocks, they do have a different characteristic to them. Um, why that happens, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Uh, to be honest, they, they've kind of they they diverged from underlying worldwide liquidity as well, which they traditionally have followed that. But if you look recently over the last several months, there's a huge increase in jaws, like the jaws are getting wider and wider between what um, worldwide liquidity is doing and what the queues have been doing. So mm. at some point, those jaws need to close. And I don't know if it's because liquidity is going to take off. I don't think so. Uh, or because the queues and S&P 500 also uh, need to need to fall enough to, to close that gap. Because historically, they have followed very close with worldwide liquidity. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. but Yeah, no, it definitely does. And I, I, do you think passive indexations, uh, most people just piling into S&P and not thinking like that's at, at play here? I think, that's a, I think that's a big part of it for sure. Yeah. So we're at the end of the show. And what happens, just so folks know, like when we stop recording, we continue to talk about this stuff for like another <laughs> hour. <laughs> and, recording, and we always say, oh, we should have recorded the rest of this. Uh, but gentlemen, I think that uh, that's where we're going to wrap it up. Those were the topics that I wanted to cover. Uh, always uh, such a pleasure to chat with all of you guys. Let's go around the horn. You guys can give a handoff if people want to learn more about you. Jeff, go ahead and start it off. Sure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Valeshire Cap. Uh, I also run a hedge fund and um, RIA. Uh, it's called Valeshire. So if you just go to Valeshire.com, uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email or a message if you're interested. Steven? 
Hey, my Twitter handle is at Stephen McClurk. And I'm with Valkyrie. And also run a hedge fund and some ETFs and some other things. Joe? Uh, Yeah, Joe Carlosari, at Joe Carlosari. If you also Google me, you can find my firm's website. Uh, We represent a variety of Bitcoin miners. We're involved with uh, disputes in the uh, litigated disputes in the the crypto space, which there's a lot of uh, fraud and uh, wrongful conduct going on. So if you have been a victim that has been uh, wronged by a bad actor in crypto, please feel free to reach out. If I can't help you, somebody else will. Um, and if you have any claims, breach of fiduciary duty, litigated commercial claims, i um, happy to help and happy to talk with you at any point. Just reach out to me on my website. Uh, on Twitter, I mostly uh, post macro stuff and don't post as much legal stuff as I probably should, but Looking forward to talking to anybody who wants to pick my brain about something. Gents, thank you so much for your time. This was a blast. The fall of Rome was death by a thousand cuts, really. It all happened more and more with greater and greater frequency. That's sort of happening to us. And so it's a question of like, how do we get out of that? I mean, I don't think people are aware of the scale of the national debt increase right now. And like, because you hear six and a half trillion dollars annualized growth and it doesn't really mean anything. So I I ran some numbers to try to humanize this. That is $12 million every minute. So we are currently adding $12 million of debt every single minute of every single day. 